The Shaping of Gondor Part 4 The Line of Kalmakil Chapter 3 Recovery Eldakar, after an interregnum of ten years, was now king once more, and he began his restored rule by setting to work at once. A guard was placed on the southern border, though the king himself returned to the royal ward. Certain repairs were made in Osgiliath, but the great city was never to recover its earlier premacy, and would inexorably fall into eclipse, then decay and dereliction. Nonetheless, roads were mended, pastures regrown, and houses built anew. Moreover, in 1458, the Council of Gondor was convoked. All of Castamere's decrees, sentences, and taxes were rescinded, and his name was stricken from all public records and monuments. Because of this, there has oft been some confusion among scribes as to whether or not to include Castamere among the list of kings of Gondor. Eldakar and his immediate successors made his illegitimacy indelibly clear at the time. However, the various historians have taken off differing views on the matter over the preceding centuries according to their own wisdom. I, for my part, will count him among the kings, since he did in fact wear the crown and exert his will upon the realm, if only begrudgingly and for a short while. Perhaps the greatest catastrophe of the kin strife was the depletion of the kingdom's manpower. Umbar and Harad were now lost, and with them nearly half the population which had lived under the royal scepter preceding the war. This meant a severely shrunken tax reservoir, and consequently a reduction of spending in royal works and projects. Furthermore, since the vast majority of the navy had defected to Umbar, the period of Gondorian supremacy on the waves of the Bay of Belfalas came to an end after six centuries and nearly all the attainments of the ship kings were tragically undone. To be sure, Eldakar attempted to reverse this state of affairs by attempting an invasion of Umbar in 1463, but without proper navy support it was doomed to failure, and the king had to withdraw after two years. He was more successful in fighting off an attack on Hjarmenelos by the Umbardrum in 1465, but Gondor was to be unable to do more than fight de defensively to the south for a long time. The 1460s also witnessed the beginning of a considerable influx of new settlers in the north. Aware of the depletion of able hands to till the soil and tend to the cattle on the farmsteads and plantations, especially in the royal ward, Eldakar allowed a great many of his, of his Northmanish kin, perhaps as many as 80,000, to enter Rovanion and take up new homes in Anorian and Athelion. These did much to help repopulate these lands, and to supply the royal coffers with hardy and reliable taxpayers. In all these measures, the seeds of a slow recovery were planted. By the time Eldakar the Fair died in his 235th year in Virasay of 1490, he was a weary man indeed. Though his kingly virtues, his courage, fortitude, and very real ability can be aptly admired, it is nonetheless difficult to view his reign as anything but calamitous. He had succeeded in preserving his kingship, but the cost to the realm had been heavy indeed. Umbar and Harad were lost, Gondor's navies were decimated, and over 100,000 Gondorian soldiers and common folk had been slain in a terrible civil war. The once glittering cities of Osgiliath and Etalon were ravaged and half demolished, a state of things mirrored in many other townships across the land. Attempting to mend these marrings of war would be the first task of the kings who sat the white throne during the next century and a half. By the time of the death of Eldakar, a subtle change was beginning to come over the land, over the land of the Seven Heartlands. Through both the destructions it had wrought and its, and its predication on tradition, the kin strife had altered the character of the way in which many Gondorians perceived themselves in the wider world. Previous to Castamere's ascendancy, commerce and intermingling from abroad had been welcomed and encouraged under the scepters of the White Throne. Elves, 
wharves, and men of the north and east had come and gone freely throughout the cities and havens of the Gondorian realm. Now, however, that began to fall by the wayside, and Gondor began to withdraw into isolation. Even the language was altering. The elven tongues had never been particularly widely spoken in the Stoneland, being something of a novelty of the high classes, and only the most learned scribes and dignitaries. Tongue of Numenor had sunk deeper roots, especially in the coastal regions, and it continued to be spoken by many. However, both were now fading quickly in favor of the common Westron speech, so that even in her manner of writing and conversing, the past was being discarded. It didn't happen all at once, or everywhere in the Dominion. Ports such as Tharbad, Pelargir, Dolmirathas, and Linhir continued to be large and rich. The great paved roads and ways to the north, south, and east remained well trodden. Ships still, stale, still, still sailed up and down the coasts of the Sea of Belagir. But nevertheless, it could not be denied that many Gondorians now harbored a suspicion of those who dwelt beyond their borders. Perhaps there was good re reason for this apprehension. Had not the kinstrife been fought on account of the induction of foreign blood into the royal house? Were the realms of men to the north in Iriador not being mortally threatened yearly by the relentlessly growing power of Angmar? Were not Umbar and Harad now once again free to strike and ravage Gondor's havens and harbors as they had done of old? It began to seem natural, therefore, to shun the ways and customs of other lands, and to look to their own devices for comfort and security. And so a pall of suspicion and mistrust of outsiders took hold among Gondor's peoples, one which would slowly but steadily accrue over the following centuries until, in time, few ever passed the mighty gates of the Argomath. Matters of commerce and tongues, however, probably concerned Aldemir, second son of and heir of Eldacar, little during these years. In many respects, his temperament and his high office were an unfortunate pairing. Having grown up in the shadow of his executed elder brother Ornendil, he was a rather solitary and contemplative man, and would altogether have been better suited to the life of a scribe or a sage. One is reminded of the legacies of Erendil the Wise, Osterher, and Siriondil. Nevertheless, to his credit, he tried hard and did his best to be a goodly monarch. It was Umbar and Harad which were to be the perpetual hindrance of Aldemir's reign. For having secured their independence of Gondor's rule, they lost no opportunity to assail and harass the latter. In 1500, and then again in 1510, large fleets commanded by Angamir, son of the dead Castamir, ravaged the coast of Harondor and Tolfalas, shedding much blood and making off with much booty. Both were repulsed with much difficulty, but during the second strike, the great, Helven, the great haven of Hjarminolos was taken by the Umbardrum and its population enslaved. This left the whole of Harondor dangerously vulnerable to invasion from the south, and Aldemir and his captains were bent on retaking it. To this end, in 1535, a well-armed force was marched south across the upper Harnan near Barad Vorn and into Harad. The object was to reduce a broad swath of Haradrim ground surrounding the city, thus outflanking the corsairs and starving them of aid. It was a clever stratagem and might well have succeeded, but for the intercession of weather and chance. Through ill luck, a number of heavy rains swelled the Harnan in both 1537 and 1539, causing it to flood, and so cutting off Aldemir's supply lines. This caused his army to fall prey to disease and privation, as well as manpower depletion. Small companies of Haradrim warriors continually harassed and picked off the king's men piecemeal. In Sulame of 1540, the campaign suffered a still further misfortune, when the Haradrim offered to parley for peace near the town of Keristal, only to treacherously ambush Aldemir and slay him and his retinue with black arrow arrows. As neither a man nor a king had he been what Gondor's situation required, 
but he had all he had acted always with courage and good faith and surely merited better than such an ignominious and dishonorable fate if the sothrans had fought had, had thought that by killing aldemir they had secured victory they were swiftly disabused of that notion for the latter's son vinyarion now took over both the throne and leadership of the campaign and proved an altogether more dangerous and capable opponent Accompanying him was the mysterious figure of the elf Sentir the Black. Whether he came from, none knew. However, it was rumored that he was of the sylvan elves of the woodland realm of Mirkwood. Many were the prophecies he gave to the beleaguered king, saying to him, Upon the banks of two rivers will you find both your greatest glory and deepest folly, but ever must you look to them nonetheless. For I fear that the shadow is burgeoning once more to mar our middle earth. And all too soon, ere your children are grown old, your countrymen will feel its wrath. For only with the withering of Gondor and your line will its path be clear to reclaim the dominion it had of old. And you must be always vigilant, as a lantern in a chill and stormy night. It was a foretelling the king would ever bear steadily in mind. Vinyarion, surveying the situation, was wise enough to realize that he did not have sufficient numbers to fight the Haradrim hordes effectively. He therefore moved north and encamped around Bar Amrum, a haven some two hundred leagues upriver from Hjarminolos. There he assiduously gathered his strength, and when the time was right, he made his move. Traveling on a southwesterly course parallel with the Harnum, Vinyarion's troops, mostly composed of lightly armed horsemen, marched warily. Although numerous Haradrim bands attempted to engage them, all were handily defeated and sent fleeing. In Urme of 1551, the Sothrans thought that they had their chance, when they managed to catch Vinyarion encamped near the flood of the Malduin River, with only a small ford nearby to serve as a retreat. Alas, the Haradrim captains underestimated the Gondorians, and under the agile leadership of their king, the latter were able to hack and spear their way out of the trap. Vinyarion now took the offensive and began pursuing the retreating foe. After a couple months, he found them entrenched near the banks of the small river Avro. Although the ground favored the Haradrim, since they occupied a promontory which would have made mounted charges difficult for the Gondorians, the Sothran captains chose once again to throw caution into the winds and attack. Even the imprudence of the Haradrim might have been overborne by superior numbers, for Gondor was outmatched by these at least two to one. The former, however, foolishly allowed their line to become badly overextended in their charge, and Vinyarion's fleet, but well-armed and armored paladins, were able to smash through without much trouble. The Haradrim army, now divided, quickly fell into disorder, and the battle became first a rout, than a slaughter, as the Gondorian cavalry quickly cut them down. Even those Sothrans who managed to make a successful retreat were soundly pursued and slain. The battle at the Avro, overwhelming victory that it was, did not signal an end to the Sothran venture, just yet, however. Yarmenelos still remained in Haradrim and Umbardrum hands, and Vinyarion lost no time in placing it under siege. Although the barbarian defenders res resisted stubbornly and fiercely for two years, in the end they had to relent. The king marched in triumph through the city gates in Lotusay of 1553, and the haven that Taranon Falastir had founded was in Gondorian hands once more. It would remain so for a further three centuries. Both Harad and Umbar, though, incensed by their defeats, had had enough for now and sued for peace. The king, for his part, recognizing that both his supply lines and troop numbers were stretched nearly to the breaking point, accepted. Vinyarion's successes in this war against the Sothrans were much celebrated throughout the Seven Heartlands, and her peoples and nobles began to hail the latter as Hjarmindekil II, in remembrance of the South victor's astonishing conquests five centuries before. And it is, as, and it is by that title that he has passed into history. Jarmendekil II, however, knew better than to take too much pride in his title. Harad had been defeated, 
and the Harnan secured true enough, but the Sothran barbarian realm itself still remained free to strike at will, as well as to aid Gondor's enemies in the future. Umbar likewise remained unsubdued to assail the coasts, for all its panoply among the populace, the king's victory fell well short of that of his namesake, and he knew it well. In recognition of this fact, Jarmendekil in 1559 ordered the northern banks of the Harnan to be fortified with heavy bulwarks and garrisons. The Sothrans might swear to peace for the moment, but he knew only strong walls would hold them to it for any length of time. Hence, work was commenced under the king's patronage. All did not go entirely without trouble, of course. The combined cost of the war against the Haradrim and the king's construction projects in the south had imposed a heavy burden on the treasury, and this in turn demanded higher taxes. In resentment, many of the guildsmen and small folks in Lebanon and Harandor rose up in revolt in the autumn of 1567. This noisome occurrence, which took several years to quell, proved only a minor distraction, however. Ironically enough, just as with the first South Victor, the latter part of the reign of Fjarmendikil II was to be preoccupied with events to the north. Let us briefly turn there to observe what was occurring. In the seventh century since Arnor's dissolution into petty kingdoms, all three had weakened inexorably. In 1409, around the time that civil war was threatening to consume Gondor, Rudaur and Cardolan had fallen prey to the forces of the Darkling Kingdom of, Ang of Angmar and its fell Witch King, and had been completely destroyed. Only Arthedain now remained of the northern realm of the Adain in Middle-earth. Yet now, so great had Agmar's strength become that even that was trembling at the, age of ruin, at the edge of ruin. Two successive kings of Arthedain, Argileb and Arvileg, had been killed in battle defending their borders. Empty farmsteads, crumbling townships, fallow fields, and decaying roads dotted the land. All about lay the encroaching signs of desolation. This was the state of things when in 1576, King Arafor, son of Arvileg of Arthedine, sent envoys to Hjarmindikil II, warning of the ascending menace of Angmar, and proposing a renewal of the alliance of old between the men of the north and south. The king of Gondor received these tidings with concern. So weighty had the threats to the south lain upon the minds of the court that precious little thought had been given to the realm's northern provinces, and it was perhaps at this time there came into his mind the echo of his friend Sentier's warning years earlier. To ascertain their condition, after satisfying himself of the stability of the southern borders which took some years, Yarmindikil resolved to attend to them in person. There he went in Yavanye of 1596. By this time, King Arafor was dead in Arthendine, after a reign of 180 years, no less, and his son Argileb II now ruled in his stead. There was little Argileb could do, to be sure, in light of his realm's weakness to assist Yarmindikil, but he too sent emissaries of friendship, together with a battalion of warriors, to assist in the defense of Tharbad, which Yarmindikil received with gratitude. On his royal tour, the king found the defenses of his northern lands to be in a sorry state of disrepair and inadequacy, particularly along the northern bounds of Rovanion and Inidwaith, both of which now, laid, now lay almost unguarded from the depredations of the inhabitants of Mirkwood and the Dunlandings, respectively. Many roads and causeways were sorely in need of repairs and rebuilding, and Jarmindekil went about this task with grim dedication. This, of course, called for yet more exactions from Gondor's already perilously depleted coffers, but in the king's mind the security of the realm's boundaries rose superior to all else. In all, he passed some twenty-three years altogether in these regions, attending to many details, projects, and inspections. The northwestern border, along the course of the Gwathlo, where the Enidwaith bounded Miniriath, which had once formed part of the petty land of Cardolan, was of special care for it lay closest of all, Gondorian's, of all Gondorian possessions to the advancing might of Angmar. Jarmendikil was determined to ensure its safety. To that purpose, in 1610, he marched a force of 5,000 spears across the Guathlo into Cardolan, 
with the intention of taking control of the northern bank of the river as a bulwark against Angmar. Some territory was indeed successfully occupied, but progress was slow and hard going, with the free folk of Miniriath resisting every foot of the way. Disease and unseasonable weather likewise exacted a toll on the royal banner, and ere five years had passed, all enthusiasm for the march had vanished among the Gondorians. This culminated in, an, in a most shameful event in 1615, when, whilst a camp, encamped in winter quarters outside the haven of Tharbad, the king's army was lured by a band of Dunlendings and Rudarmen into a wild goose chase into the hinterland of Miniriath, only to be outmaneuvered and routed in the unfamiliar terrain. This disaster meant an end to the northwestern campaign, and Charmendekil was forced to withdraw back across the river, being simply without the resources and men and monies to replace so large a force. After the defeat at Tharbad, Charmendekil was done in the north. Though not wholly fruitless, the attempt to shore up the northwestern border had cost far more than it had been worth, and there were even heavier problems to be dealt with elsewhere and closer to home. Enidwaith and the lands adjourning it were left just as vulnerable as ever. These would slowly depopulate in the years following, as more and more garrisons and soldiers were, recall were recalled to the Seven Heartlands to deal with more pressing matters, and the common folk followed them and their protection in fear of Angmar and the increasingly barbaric men of the north. Jaramindakil returned to the royal ward in Hisame of 1617, and busied himself with the mundane task of attempting to refill the coffers of a royal treasury that a reign of almost unremitting war had emptied. He died four years later, in the midsummer of 1621. Jarmendekil II's is a legacy most difficult to assess. His greatest victory, the vanquishing of the Haradrim at the Avro, was a close-run thing, one which had been brought about as much by the king's good fortune as by his valor. His worst failure, the disaster of Tharbad and the failed invasion of Miniriath, was likewise due as much to ill fortune as to kingly imprudence. Both were heavily costly to the tax-paying subjects of the realm. However, his maintenance of the border defenses is most surely worthy of praise, even if, even if he only went, went about it in fits and starts, especially in light of the events which followed closely on the heels of his passing. For the peace Jarmendekil had bought at the Avro was to prove to be merely a temporary stay in Gondor's troubles from across the Harnan, and his people were to see Sentir the Black's prediction fulfilled all too soon after his passing. <laughs>